please give a very warm welcome to our guest speaker tonight at the third annual Leveson Lecture, the end of 300 years of press freedom. Pull the other one, the wonderful Joe Brand. Hello. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. It is a real pleasure uh, to be here, to be delivering the third uh, Leveson Annual Lecture and to be doing something for Hacked Off, who uh, I've admired for uh, a very long time. Now, um, my expectations of you are wide open, as are yours of me, probably. You're thinking, does she know anything? Is she going to be funny? Is she going to swear? Well, you'll see. Um, and uh, as a stand-up comedian uh, and uh, national fitness icon, <laughs> I, I realise I'm a bit of an odd choice for this lecture, but let's just play it by ear and see how it goes. Now, as far as you're uh, concerned, uh, as an audience, you're quite unusual for me. You're not pissed by the look of you yet. So that's always a bonus as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I'll obviously kind of get to know who you are as we go through this. But um, in this job, I am constantly faced with the um, unexpected. Let me just give you an example. Um, a year or so ago, I was in a hotel in Southampton, um, ostensibly about to perform a 45-minute set for 700 builders. Now, um, when you do those sort of jobs, you are, as the... The, comed the guest comedian, you are a surprise. And uh, as I walked on, there was an audible sigh of despair. <laughs> there really was. And um, I could tell that they were looking at me thinking, what on earth can a portly menopausal woman possibly have to say to us about building? And this is where sometimes you can surprise people, you know, because I said to them, actually, you will be surprised because my dad is a structural engineer. Uh, my brother is a quantity surveyor, and my husband's a fucking plank. So, um, <laughs> you can rely on me to talk to you about scaffolding. Um, so, we're, we're here uh, to uh, talk about newspapers. Now, to me, the way that we read and interpret newspapers is dependent on so many things. Our personality, our politics, uh, our attitude towards a variety of uh, institutions, our education, our intelligence, uh, the list goes on. Uh, now, once upon a time, I was a very uh, naive person. I believed that the newspapers just wrote what was going on. It was true, and that I was reading the definitive version. Uh, over the years, and through some very bitter experience, I have learned that this could not be further from the truth. Uh, newspapers, in some cases, are a complex construction of editorial perversity, personal politics, prejudice, petty vendetta, racism at times, bias. Uh, I'll stop there. I have many more from the Roger's thesaurus, if you'd like them, but we don't want to go on all night. Um, now, I know, uh, now I know that uh, what is printed in some newspapers can be about as near to the truth as not the truth at all. Uh, now, depending on which news source uh, you read and how you read your uh, newspaper, um, a series of archetypes tend to float in front of your eyes every day, and sometimes through prolonged contact, uh, these archetypes do become a kind of reality for uh, the reader, so that the next time you meet those characters again uh, in your newspaper, you're forearmed uh, with the knowledge of, of what they really are, and you can slot comfortably uh, into believing what you're going to read about them. Let me just do a little list. People on benefits are scroungers. Uh, asylum seekers are bogus, uh, except Mo Farah. Uh, Muslims are violent extremists, except Mo Farah. Um, <laughs> celebrities are attention-seeking, vain, and emotionally immature. Uh, that is actually true in my case, but <laughs> on the whole, we can't believe that of everyone. Uh, climate change scientists are clueless boffins. Climate change deniers are top scientists. Uh, vicars are randy. Sex workers are hookers or whores. Actresses and female singers have grown breasts solely for the purpose of pointing them at a camera. 
Uh, tabloid journalists are heroes in pursuit of the truth. Uh, police are heroes in pursuit of villains, except where the villains are journalists when the police are plods attacking the lifeblood of democracy. <laughs> Young people are always drunk or on drugs or both. Um, feminists wear DMs, dungarees and have shaven heads, or is that plumbers? And <laughs> cat owners are weirdos. Uh, all right, I made that one up. But um, <laughs> add your own from your own newspaper. Uh, if you're a male reader, you might want to recall uh, the fact that I am a 16-stone loudmouth who doesn't care about her appearance. I'm so sorry. Now, we know uh, that uh, leading up to Leveson, for many years, some newspapers uh, had been responsible for a catalogue of abuse, vindictiveness, uh, intrusions, and criminal behaviour. Uh, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, for example, that Kate McCann's private diary was published on the front page of a newspaper, an act so unkind and dishonest it beggars belief. I mean, bad enough as a standalone betrayal, but for someone suffering the disappearance of a child, unforgivable. Uh, the case of David Nutt was also chilling. In 2008, he was chairman of the supposedly independent advisory council on the misuse of drugs, the so-called drug czar. Uh, on the basis of scientific evidence, uh, he came to the independent, uh, correct but controversial view that alcohol and tobacco were more harmful than ecstasy and LSD, and objected to the reclassification of cannabis as a class B rather than class C drug. Uh, in late 2009, he was sacked by the government for refusing to recant his views. Uh, his views on drugs were a red rag to the male and the sun bulls who went much further than vigorous condemnation in their editorial and opinion columns, to which they were perfectly entitled. Uh, within a week of his dismissal, the Sun published a double-page spread making allegations about all three of David Nutt's children. Uh, they published a photo of his younger son uh, taken from Facebook saying that it showed him apparently smoking dope, uh, when in fact it was a roll-up. Uh, it referred to photos of his daughter apparently drinking underage, she wasn't, and of his older son prancing naked. There's a lot of prancing naked goes on in the tabloids, isn't there? Must do it sometime to upset a lot of people. <laughs> he was prancing naked in the snow in Sweden. He'd actually just come out of a sauna. I don't think he was actually prancing at all. Uh, now, these errors were resolved uh, by The Sun publishing uh, a tiny letter on page 53, uh, written by Nut Sun, putting uh, the record straight. A similar story uh, published online by the Mail the following day was defended on the grounds that they'd taken it from the sun. Um, it was removed, but there was no apology. Now, uh, these stories might have been uh, malicious and deliberately designed to intimidate a public figure whose views the newspaper despised, but they were not uh, illegal. Uh, people call it the gutter press. Um, I wouldn't rate it that highly myself. Um, one of the many myths around press conduct uh, is that the criminal offences committed by newspapers just needed to be dealt with, and justice uh, has now been done. Not quite the whole story, I'm afraid. Let's just add systematic failure of ethical behaviour, contempt for codes of practice, and data theft on an industrial scale to that. Uh, when you look at how long the press has had to effectively regulate itself, uh, 65 years, and how un utterly uh, unsuccessful that's been, it's time to underline, highlight, reiterate, back in thesaurus land again, that the pressure has to be seriously ramped up uh, to stop things sliding back into the swamp of apathy in which they floated for a very long time. Uh, let's talk about journalists for a bit, because um, something that, that can be very difficult to do uh, when reviewing the depressing examples of press misconduct um, is not to tar all journalists with the same brush and blame them for the shortcomings of their newspapers. I mean, I have found myself hating certain journalists 
um, or at least their commanding officers, so vehemently in the past that I've longed for my own newspaper in which to hate them back in print, but it's never happened. Uh, for a very long time, I jousted with a charming journalist called Gary Bushell. Um, he's gone, I haven't. Why, hey! Um, <laughs> I don't know where he is, actually, um, but it, he kind of started it, so I felt, you know, it was all right to, um, to come back at him. You know, he, he started it by calling me a hideous old boiler, amateur, and um, <laughs> the thing to bear in mind about Gary Bushell is that he's not exactly an oil painting himself. <laughs> Not unless there is an oil painting around called Constipated Warthog Licking Piss Off a Toilet Seat. <laughs> there may well be. I don't know. There's a complex uh, morass of objective reporting, subjective opinion, and editorial prejudice. And they all seem to swirl around together and, and get mixed up. Um, I am going to talk about myself here for a bit, if that's OK. Uh, and that is because I am petulant, uh, self-serving, and vain. You know the score. Uh, now, I was for many years, and, and a lot of this was down to Gary, I suppose, considered uh, to be a man-hater uh, by the press. Um, now, believe me, I've tried really hard to live up to that tag. I really have. I've tried really hard to hate all men. Um, but I'm sorry, after a lot of uh, soul searching, I can't help myself. I like my brother, and I like all the men who are my friends. Uh, you'll notice I haven't actually uh, mentioned my husband. Uh, that's because I do hate him. Um, now... There are plenty of men uh, I do hate, but it's not all of them. And I would like to stress, and I think this makes me ordinary, uh, because I don't know anyone who doesn't hate someone. Uh, I'm just clearing that up in case you have believed as I've gone round foaming at the mouth every time I see someone who owns a penis. I do not. Um, now, a constant uh, chorus uh, that we hear from sections of the press about celebrities who are relentlessly hounded is that it is not okay for them to use the press uh, to their advantage on the way up and then complain when the press are an unwanted presence in their lives. They asked for it and now they've got it, so they should shut up and stop moaning. Now, what I want to know is why isn't it all right? I mean, you can go to the library and get out a book when you want it, but that doesn't mean you've got to constantly bat off librarians leaping at you out of bushes and trying to force you to borrow a book when you don't want one. <laughs> I mean, sh it's just surely um, about uh, personal freedom. You've used that library, you scumbag, to get education and entertainment, and now when you're not in the mood, you have to put up with someone lying in wait and forcing the man book a prize list on you. <laughs> I think it's an easy argument for the press to make, and one that many people subscribe to, because the portrayal of most celebrities in the press um, it is negative. It is as vain, self-serving, money-shoveling. Um, ironically, I think, uh, an image created by the tabloids in the first place. I mean, even charitable acts committed by celebrities uh, are seen as an opportunity uh, to further careers. You know, you feel sometimes that, that you can't win. I don't want people to, to kind of heap praise on me. It would just be nice to actually do something and, and people just ignore it would be quite, would be quite good. Um, and it's, it's hard to complain. That, that's another issue I think people in the public um, I have. Because if a journalist, and I use that phrase loosely for some of the individuals who've interviewed me, um, if they give their considered opinion on you, however personal it might be, it always seems churlish if you, as the person at whom the opprobrium is directed, complains in print. It, for some reason, it just looks pathetic. It just looks needy. Um, and so most people do not do it for fear uh, of that very uh, reaction. Um, and also, you know, as a celebrity, uh, you're not entitled uh, to complain because you have such a brilliant life, you have loads of money, and you live in a castle, as a child once informed me I did. <laughs> uh, everyone runs to my castle. Now, um, we, we need to remember, um, particularly, I think, in this whole scenario, uh, that ordinary members of the public are relentlessly hounded whether they've asked for it in the past or not. 
Um, I'm not asking for sympathy for celebrities. I know we won't get it. But it is those unsuspecting citizens who are thrown into the furnace of tabloid fame without so much as even a manual who I believe really uh, deserve our sympathy. Now, the problem with the press is that in certain parts, um, it's so of necessity, I think, broad brush, and so personally uh, led by proprietors and powerful editors that it's their opinions, their likes and dislikes, and their political views that dictate everything. For example, if the Daily Mail ever said uh, I look nice at an awards ceremony, I would have a stroke. I would. Um, you know, I, what I am for the Daily Mail really is, is an example of someone who's let themselves go really badly. And uh, when I first met my husband, we, we, were, we were chased by the paps for quite a long time. Uh, because first of all, they, they couldn't believe that he weighed less than I did. Um, and <laughs> them publishing an article, there was a picture of me. Well done, the mail. They found the most hideous one possible. Uh, and uh, underneath him, it said, 12 stone and softly spoken. I don't know. I don't think they weighed him. I don't know <laughs> how they found that out. And underneath my photo, it said 16 stone loudmouth. Now, my mother was so proud. She was. Um, so, um, now, Paul Dacre obviously can't stand people like me, and I can't stand him either. So that's very even and uh, mutual. And I think that, that an alien attempting to study uh, life on Earth um, by reading the tabloids, would fail to understand that humans are quite complex beings uh, who are made up of myriad characteristics, some good and some bad, not just simple organisms whose two-adjective, one-noun description, which forever follows them throughout their life in the press, uh, in my case, originally fat man-hating lesbian, now still fat, yet miraculously married scruff bag. You know, I don't know which one I like best, really. Um, it tends, this tends to crop up whenever one's included in any sort of article, and it's not really adequate to draw um, to an accurate uh, picture. Now, why don't celebrities complain more to the press? Well, fear is the key uh, to keeping us troublesome little oiks down. Uh, we know that if we kick up a fuss and complain, that we will somehow suffer at the hands of editors we have offended. Uh, and it's so easy for them. You know, an editor once said to me, I'm going to ruin your life in my paper for the next year. Um, see, I'm still too scared to say for fear of retribution. All right, it was the Guardian food supplement. But... Um, <laughs> Now, um, indeed, uh, many high-profile figures, not just celebs, but politicians, sports stars, uh, etc., are scared of speaking out on Leveson-related issues because of fear of retribution. Um, it's the kind of intimidation usually associated with the mafia, and many journalists are fearful too. Uh, Michelle Stanistreet, uh, leader of the NUJ, uh, spoke on behalf of several journalists at the Leveson Inquiry who insisted on remaining anonymous because they were scared of the consequences of speaking out. Uh, the Daily Mail, normally the first to demand that whistleblowers are protected, rightly, uh, took Lord Justice Leveson to court to try and stop them testifying. So, how do editors try to prove their opinions about certain famous people? I think this is quite an interesting process. Um, and I just want to give you a quick example of something uh, that I experienced myself. Let, let's start with the easy premise that celebrities are greedy, they love freebies, and they trough and trouser everything they can at charity do's, right? Now, I was at a big charity do uh, once, uh, I ate nothing because I wasn't hungry. I know it sounds unlikely, but go with it. Um, however, at that particular event, photos were taken of celebrities helping themselves to food, and it was remarked upon that one individual went to the buffet six times. Uh, and, and, and that was laid out. There was a picture of that individual 
troughing at the buffet. Um, thank God it wasn't me. I mean, you know, uh, not that people would have been surprised, but um, it's quite interesting as someone on the receiving end of uh, the less savoury journalist, shall we, shall we say, that w w when they interview you, um, the, the kind of the chasm between how the interview appears to you and how it appears in print is, is really quite something. Uh, you know, the number of times I have found an interview I did absolutely unrecognizable uh, once the editorial slant has uh, been put on it is to actually realize that someone naively, in my case I know, who seemed perfectly uh, friendly and positive has absolutely slagged me off and hated me. It, it's just such a very strange uh, result. Um, so th there are bad experiences like that. So I've had a fair few of them, but it would be churlish for me to say I haven't had good ones too. I mean, the vast majority of journalists, I really want to underline this, um, are not baddies. They're sensitive, they're honest, and they do adhere to the rules. That's uh, just that I've never met any. No, I'm kidding. No, I have. I have. I've met loads. Um, and it is, is mad to suggest that anyone who supports Leveson hates journalists, because that certainly uh, isn't the case. Now, Tom Stoppard uh, differentiates between jackal journalism, what he calls jackal journalism, and St. George uh, journalism. He says... Uh, what is being sought is ultimate protection for a meaningful comeback for any citizen who thinks he has cause for complaint. A free press needs to be a respected press. It is less respected now. The resistance to a statutory monitor suggests that the dream of self-regulation persists in some quarters. Well, they had that, and through six inquiries over several decades, they blew it. Uh, it's perfectly possible, essential, to safeguard what Stoppard calls St. George journalism, uh, the kind of investigations and holding power to account that every democracy needs, whilst eliminating the horrible intimidation and abuse of power, which is jackal journalism. To suggest otherwise uh, is to argue that you have to tolerate corrupt police officers or incompetent doctors in order to allow the honest, competent ones to flourish. Uh, I want to talk now also about uh, proprietors of uh, newspapers. L let's talk about owners and proprietors for a sec, shall we? What do they have in common? All white, all old, all extraordinarily wealthy. That seems to be uh, most of Jerry Hall's tick list uh, right there. Uh, and very much all... No, maybe not. That might be uh, slanderous. But... Um, <laughs> They're not really in a position to judge others, but that's never really stopped them. Uh, nor has it stopped them threatening, uh, intimidating, victimizing, and lying about their victims and anyone who criticizes them. Uh, they pay their senior industry execs and editors very large sums of money, and some of them are prepared to lie to select committees, to other journalists, to those they traduce uh, in order to protect themselves. Um, expenses forms for payments and public officials signed by Rebecca Brooks, uh, who of course knew nothing about phone hacking, uh, and whose gratitude to her journalists apparently consists of calling them, pardon my French, fucking cunts. Uh, an interesting approach to HR and career development there, <laughs> Rebecca. Now, let's remember what uh, Rebecca Brooks said about phone hacking. As chief executive of the company, I feel a deep sense of responsibility for the people we have hurt. And I want to reiterate how sorry I am for what we now know to have taken place. Uh, to which Charlotte Church memorably replied on the steps of the royal courts, they're not really sorry, only sorry they got caught. Uh, now, how should we regulate any institution which is prone uh, to abuses? Well, first of all, I think we've discovered over the years that an industry or institution that regulates itself tends not to be very effective. Not terribly effective actually might be one of the best euphemisms I've ever used. Um, bloody useless is probably a more accurate uh, description. Uh, the Press Complaints Commission, uh, set up in the wake of public outrage uh, 25 years ago, 
was seen as a final opportunity uh, for the press to police itself. Um, I think the fact that thousands of members of the public were being hacked, uh, newspapers were doing mutual hacking, and not one whistleblower thought to tell the PCC is testament to how either dishonest or intimidated journalists were, or how useless or pointless they thought the PCC was. I don't know if you remember Clive uh, Goodman, hacker extraordinaire, who actually pleaded guilty to phone hacking back in 2006. His News of the World employers swore blind that he was a one-off, a rogue case. Uh, the industry closed ranks and pilloried The Guardian for suggesting that all might not be quite as they told it. Uh, it was only The uh, Guardian's uh, persistence... Um, and I'm delighted that uh, Nick Davis, a St. George journalist with a touch of the jackal about him, uh, is here tonight. And it was the uh, revelation that Millie Dowler's phone had been hacked that prompted the PCC uh, to be branded a failure and toothless poodle forcing its chair to resign. Uh, those revelations uh, also, of course, led to the year-long uh, Leveson inquiry. Uh, difficult, painful evidence had to be given, and new wounds were opened as those non-celebrities who'd already been victims of horrible press intrusion at a time of most vulnerability had to relive their dreadful experiences. Uh, after Leveson, the PCC was closed, and a new regulator was invented by the very same publishers who'd set up the PCC. It was called IPSO. Uh, which stood for, supposedly, uh, the Independent Press Standards Organization, IPSO. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds intelligent. Sounds Latin, doesn't it? That's because it is Latin. Uh, it means, uh, I think it means itself. Uh, the newspapers trumpeted it as the toughest regulator in the Western world. Uh, on the basis of previous behavior, Sir Brian Leveson predicted exactly this kind of rebranding which uh, before IPSO was created, he had called a pattern of cosmetic reform. Now, IPSO appointed a former High Court judge, uh, Sir Alan Moses, to be its chairman on the assumption that this would convince everyone that it was independent of the newspapers who pay for it. But IPSO is not free to make... Uh, not free to make uh, decisions and act independently. Uh, any investigations it wants to run or sanctions it wants to impose or appeal system it might set up uh, is subject to approval by the newspapers who own it. It's their rules he has to play by and he has no powers uh, to improve their rule book. So uh, Alan claims uh, he has a legally enforceable power uh, to compel his newspapers to publish a correction uh, if he does not uh, use it. Uh, in a not uh, a single case of uh, front page headline code breach, has there been a front page apology or correction, uh, let alone one in headlines? He has no part power to require an apology at all. Uh, Ipso's willingness and their power to protect people from discrimination uh, was tested in the case of Emily Brothers, a uh, Labour Party, uh, Labour parliamentary candidate at the last election who's blind and transgender. The ever charming Rod Little, I don't know if you know him, uh, mocked her blindness and transgender status in his son column. Uh, Transmedia Watch complained on her behalf to Ipso that Mr. Rod's comments breached clause 12 of their code of conduct. The complaint was upheld, uh, but then the Sun was allowed to continue its mockery in the response it made. Uh, whilst the complaint was pending, the Sun and Rod continued to take the piss out of Emily Brothers, and when the correction uh, finally materialised, it was buried without the headline which Ipso's rules require it to have. Uh, when she complained, Ipso ignored the victimisation and said that it considered the first line of the article to be the headline. Useful to know, isn't it? I'll remember that in future. So has press uh, behaviour changed under Ipso? This is a rhetorical question, really. Uh, let's take one example. Um, because there are editors and publishers who tell us, and they honestly believe it, that things have improved. Uh, that's just because no one's hacking phones anymore, so they say. Uh, we really have nothing to worry about. The press is reformed. Uh, it has understood its mistakes and is contrite. And these nasty abuses uh, really won't happen again, really. 
Well, listen to this. Uh, a 20-year-old lad from Jersey, Chris, was falsely accused by the papers of murdering his best friend whilst on a holiday of a lifetime in Thailand. A scary uh, echo of what happened to Hacked Off's good friend, Christopher Jeffries. You may, may remember this story, actually, as the Thai uh, murders. The headlines uh, in the mirror and the sun screamed, Brit kills Holes pals, slaughtered in paradise uh, by a Brit. Bloodbath in paradise, hunt for killer on the run. But Chris hadn't actually killed anyone, let alone his childhood friend of 20 years. He hadn't even been treated as a suspect, and he certainly didn't flee the island. The police actually gave him a lift to the ferry. Ipso made no comment, Ipso mounted no investigation, Ipso issued no fines. It was left to Chris to sue the son for libel, which he did. He won modest damages and a tiny correction that didn't come anywhere close to the promised upfront corrections we were promised by Ipso. And it, it was certainly not enough to stop the papers doing the same thing to someone else. Maybe you, maybe me, another time. Then there's Linda uh, from Yorkshire. She underwent weight loss surgery that transformed her life. She, she lost 16 stone and was uh, able to climb Snowdon at the mountain, not Edward, um, <laughs> to, um, to raise money for charity. Um, it was a remarkable achievement and a classic good news story uh, that could inspire others uh, to leave healthy, lead healthier lives. I, I've tried to do that myself as well. You know, I, I, I woke up recently um, about two o'clock in the morning thinking, God, I haven't done any exercise since I was two. <laughs> and I went to my GP to check out, uh, you know, whether, well, whether I'd had it really. And I said, is it too late? He said, it's never too late. Just do something a couple of times a week that gets you slightly out of breath. So I started smoking again. <laughs> and um, I feel great. No, I do. So um, Linda's story was a classic good news story, but a journalist at the Star decided to pick it apart, to turn it on, his, on its head. They called her a grubby granny and claimed, contrary to the facts, that she hadn't washed for 20 years. They actually haven't, but they don't know that yet. Um, outrageous. Linda complained to Ipso, but they refused to help. They said she had to find her own grounds for complaint, and when she did, Ipso took the paper's side. Uh, Linda had complained that the claims were inaccurate and discriminated against her physical disability, two of the permitted grounds for complaint. Uh, in fact, the claims weren't just accurate, inaccurate, they were a deliberate hurtful distortion. Ipso decided uh, that the word fat wasn't an insult, uh, even though that wasn't what Linda was arguing. Uh, Ipso ignored the lie that she was unwashed. Ipso even rewrote the medical textbooks to rule that morbid obesity requiring surgery was not a physical condition. Thanks to Ipso, the star had to to pay no price. It published a tiny correction and apology uh, when no one would notice it. Uh, Linda has also asked Ipso about the process for claiming compensation, but she was simply ignored. The list just goes on, really. Andy Miller is a businessman who fought a libel case against the Daily Mail for six long years. Six years and one only for the regulator to decide that it didn't need to tell its readers the outcome, breaking its own rules. And a young traveler woman wrongly blamed for two deaths. In August last year, a man aged 71 uh, killed his wife, aged 70, before taking his own life. The couple's stepdaughter told reporters that she thought the tragedy happened because Mr. Knott's love for his wife and his distress over her degenerative illness but a number of national newspapers decided that the cause must have been the lawful planning application of a young traveler woman. Their supersized headlines were hysterical. Gypsy agony suicide. Gypsy camp stress drove couple to suicide pact. Man who feared travelers were surrounding his home shoots dead wife and himself. Can you imagine how you would feel if that was you? Um, as if that wasn't uh, bad enough, in April this year, after a complaint to Ipso was made, 
five national newspapers repeated the false claims. They were apparently uh, reporting on the inquest uh, into the deaths, but the coroner's verdict made no reference to travelers as the cause of the actions. This is a particularly egregious case uh, because it was a classic gypsy witch hunt story pursued in front page headlines by the Mail, Sun and Express without the slightest interest in the truth. And just think, if the word gypsy were substituted with the name of any other ethnic minority, Jew or Sikh, one has to wonder whether Ipso would have treated them with so little regard. These are not isolated examples. They are just the tick tip of the iceberg. Chris, Linda, Andy, Emily, they just found themselves written about in the press, just like hundreds of others who are too scared to speak out. What happened to them could happen to anyone. In some cases, it's taken these and other individuals months or years to get their lives back on track, and yet nothing has changed. Uh, and that's all before we start to look at the dodgy polls on migrants, uh, reckless reporting on suicide that puts vulnerable people at risk, the litany of claims about what causes and cures cancer without so much as a packet of Skittles worth of evidence. Do these stories even matter? When migrant groups uh, tell us that such stories drive up hate crime, when professional bodies like the Samaritans and Mind uh, provide evidence that reckless suicide reporting puts vulnerable people at risk of copycat suicides, and when a fabricated story, such as the one which claimed that a grandma took her own life because of charity cold calling, results in a government inquiry and new rules on how charities operate, operate it's clear that such misreporting does matter, and it matters a lot. Be in no doubt, press abuse continues. And in the face of all this, the Latin flunky Ipso still pretends that it has teeth. So what do we know about this brand new regulator? Well, we know that it's the toughest regulator in the Western world, in capitals. And um, how do we know that? Because the press and its serried ranks of apologists keep telling us. Okay, they say, maybe the PCC wasn't as tough as it might have been, but this time those pesky newspapers had better watch out. Why? Well, for one thing, Ipso can carry out proper investigations. I have every confidence that these will be carried out with the kind of forensic skill and efficiency of Inspector Clouseau himself. <laughs> and after that, if our champion regulator thinks a newspaper has done wrong, it can impose really serious sanctions. Uh, not just a slap on the wrist, but fines of up to a million pounds. Well, let's just see how these terrifying sanctions work in practice, shall we? Think about all the cases I've mentioned and more. How many fines did Ipso levy? No doubt you're waiting with bated breath to hear the terrible savaging that the Sun received at the hands of the toughest regulator in the Western world. This is what happened. Nothing. Okay, no fines, but how many investigations did it launch into any of these cases or any others in the last 13 months? None. The square root of fuck all, basically. <laughs> Does anyone really believe that in the face of that kind of deliberate pig-headedness uh, by the biggest selling daily paper in the country, this regulator is really going to try fining anyone? Toy town money, maybe from a toy town regulator. And here's the reason why Ipso, for its blather and propaganda and desperate puffery in the editorial columns of virtually every newspaper in the country, is as useless as its PCC predecessor, because it is owned and run by the same people. Now, you won't have heard of the regulatory funding company. Sounds quite harmless, doesn't it? Uh, I certainly won't be able to say it more than once, so I'll abbreviate it to RFC. The RFC is the shadowy group uh, which writes and controls the rules for Ipso. It dictates the budget for Ipso. It writes the code of conduct for those Ipso is supposed to regulate. Virtually nothing that Ipso does with any serious and effect effective regulatory meeting can be done without the permission of the RFC. It is even involved in the appointments of Ipso. Uh, and who is the RFC? It's essentially big publishing groups. Murdoch's News UK, Rothermere's Associated Newspapers, Desmond's Express and Star Newspapers, the Barclay Brothers Telegraph Group, and the Mirror Group. Those same five groups 
who were most responsible for some of the most disgraceful intrusions and outrageous inaccuracies that journalism has ever seen. Uh, they are the powers behind the throne of the Independent Press Standards Organization. And however much its vaunted chairman, Sir Alan Moses, might protest that he's in charge and no one tells him what to do, I'm afraid his cover's been blown. He would like, he said, to take a red pen to many of the RFC's rule. When the RFC's then chairman, Paul Vickers, appeared in front of a House of Lords parliamentary committee in January, he could not have been clearer. This is what he said. When Sir Alan says he's going to put a red line through a whole load of things, he can't. Moreover, said Vickers, the RFC have told Moses to come back to them when you've got some experience of running the system. And if things aren't working, we'll see if we can change the system. Translation, the RFC's message to the chairman of IPSO is much the same as the Sun's, an unsubtle and unequivocal two fingers or one. So there you have Ipso, an independent, effective, and tough as the proverbial uh, chocolate teapot. Uh, in other words, the Press Complaints Commission reborn. So what do we have to do now? Well, picture this. A weak government caved into the blandishments of the press industry determined to avoid proper accountability for the way it failed to implement its own code of conduct. Following a series of abuses and outrageous intrusions into privacy, the government established an, in, an independent inquiry. Sound familiar? This was the 1980s. They, ap they appointed Sir David Colcutt to run the inquiry, and he recommended setting up a new press complaints commission on the strict understanding that it would be entirely independent of the industry. So the industry set up the PCC with a few amendments of its own thrown in, like, for example, making sure that they controlled every aspect of its operation. The Conservative government at the time was not happy, and when the PCC had been running for a couple of years, the government asked David Calcutt to review its performance. This is what he wrote in 1993. The PCC is not the truly independent body which it should be. Uh, it is, in essence, a body set up by the industry, financed by the industry, dominated by the industry, and operating a code of practice devised by the industry, and which is over-favourable to the industry. Sound familiar? So he recommended that a statutory tribunal should be set up, much, a much stricter regime than the moderate and proportionate framework proposed by Leveson. And the press pilloried him and screamed about the outrage of trying to shackle a free press. Sound familiar again? And then the government, under Prime Minister John Major, did what so many governments had done before. It capitulated. It did nothing. By 1995, the game was up and the press was home free. The PCC continued and within just a few years was hacking phones and stealing private information with not so much as a public interest fig leaf. But credit to John Major, he fessed up. He gave evidence to the Leveson inquiry and admitted that Calcutt was a missed opportunity and he carried on. If these changes had been made, I don't think many of the things that subsequently happened would have happened. Think about that. If he, the Prime Minister, had not bottled the recommendations of his own inquiry, the misery inflicted on subsequent victims of press abuse, abuse could have been avoided. And that's why we cannot and we will not allow the big press battalions to take us for fools once again, as they have done every time over the last seven decades. They abuse their power, they trample over people's lives, but every time moderate proposals for scrutiny are put forward, they scream foul. Well, this time, they won't win. We can't let them, we won't let them get away with yet more abuse and intimidation without being held accountable in precisely the way they demand that doctors, teachers, social workers, bankers, and civil servants are held publicly accountable. We've come a long way in the face of bitter and relentless opposition from very powerful corporations who've got no qualms about proclaiming free speech while denying access to their columns and online platforms to anyone who supports the Leveson framework. There is actually a framework. There's a historical cross-party agreement to implement the proposals of Leveson, a royal charter agreed by Parliament which establishes a system of self-regulation which is genuinely independent, not only of the press barons but all politicians. 
There's the personal word of Prime Minister David Cameron, who looked the victim's oppressive use in the eye and promised them faithfully that he would implement Leveson and would not stand by and allow this kind of cruelty and mistreatment to happen again. There's one possible fly in the ointment. There's a culture secretary who re recently made noises that he unilaterally might not implement a key part of the Leveson framework. Uh, the message to him and to the Prime Minister is that all decent and law-abiding people are watching them. I think the Prime Minister is a man of honour, and I find that hard to say, but I think he might be. I hope he is a man of his word. If there's any suggestion of backsliding from a written commitment, we'll be shouting it from the rooftops and will not let him rest. So be prepared if necessary. In the new year, if there's still no sign of action from the Culture Secretary, it might be asked that you once again raise your voices and make yourselves heard. But hopefully it won't come to that. Uh, this campaign has worked wonders in getting to the point uh, we are at and won't give up. It's well organised but badly underfunded. Uh, so my last message to you is both heartfelt and predictable. Sorry. Some of you have given generously, and uh, some of you mean bastards have given nothing at all, <laughs> apparently. Um, so please, all of you, please, if you can, do contribute to the campaign to help the Davids fight the Goliaths, to allow Hacked Off to finish the job. Uh, it is not only the victims of press abuse, past and present and future, who will be grateful. It is the many, many journalists working at the coalface who are desperate to abide by their own code of ethics and practice St. Jo George journalism, who want to see a different culture in their own newsrooms. Preferably one, I'm going to say it again, where their bosses do not refer to them as fucking cunts. <laughs> Thank you very much.